I thank God that my relationship to him has been established on one ground alone. That is, that he loves me with an everlasting love. And that has drawn from my heart the response of an everlasting love. He's my husband, and as Ephesians 5 says, the first thing of that relationship is that he loves me. You know, I'm learning something about his love for me. I mentioned to you a few weeks ago, I think, that I just discovered that he loves me with all different kinds of love. I always thought of him just loving me with agapus love. And I thought, that's the only kind he's capable of. But he's capable of agapus love as opposed to us who are not capable of agapus love. You see? He has a love to give that no human being can give. But it does not keep him from loving us with the same kind of love that human beings love each other with, too. For instance, philios love is a love of friendship. I've called it a performance love. Because this love that is expressed on this level depends entirely upon a suitable performance on both parties. If you do that which brings me pleasure, it calls this kind of love out of my heart for you because of the pleasure which you afford me. And when I do something that brings you pleasure, there's a love that comes out of your heart from me because of the pleasure that I've caused you. And you mustn't think of that kind of love as being totally evil. God loves me with that kind of love too. When I do those things which bring him pleasure, it calls this kind of love out. And when he does things for me that gives me pleasure, it calls this kind of love out for him. This is something extra besides Agapus love, which is unconditional and has takes no note of who I am or what I am, but just gives itself wholly to me. I don't like to talk too much about Agapus love being a kind of love. Agapus love is God. God is love. But in marriage... You wouldn't want to be married and have nothing but spiritual love between you. And you neither, on the other hand, would want to be, lo- to be married and have nothing but physical love between you. You wouldn't want to be married and have only the kind of love that denies also the love of friendship. All these things are involved in God's love for me, for instance. He's my husband. Therefore, he loves me with a passionate love. He loves me with a love that flows from our oneness. But yet, at the same time, he's my friend who can listen objectively to me, who can somehow become emotionally uninvolved with me long enough to hear me and see my viewpoint and be touched by the feelings of my infirmities. For he realizes that in ministering to me, he's really ministering to himself because no man hates his own body. And Paul says when the husband ministers to his wife, he's ministering to his own needs. So Jesus is is more than just my lover for all eternity. He's my friend. My friend. A friend, the Arabs say, is someone that you can pull the contents of your heart out to. Wheat and chaff alike. In the realization that the, the hand of kindness that sifts these things will blow the chaff away with a breath of kindness. That's the kind of friend Jesus is. Someone you can just pour the mixed up, pent up emotions of your heart out to. The rights and the wrongs together. The goods and the bads. You can take your jumbled up thoughts. Your messed up mind. 
your upset emotions, the pieces of your broken heart and your life, and you can just spread them all out in front of Jesus without any shame, without any fear. He'll throw away the things that don't matter and don't count and aren't needed. And you put them together in some kind of meaningful pattern for you. He's, he's really my friend. I said to uh, one of my sons one time when he said something about his friends, and maybe I shouldn't have told him this, but it was true, and I said, you don't have any friends. Well, what do you mean I don't have any friends? Oh, i got lots of friends. I said, name 75, just to start with. Just name one. So he started naming his friends. And I said, you know what a friend is? A friend is someone who will go down with you if you go down. A friend is someone who will go with you, win, lose, or draw. Mark Twain one time said, a friend is somebody who will stay with you when you're wrong. He said, any fool will stay with you when you're right. Right? So I said, you don't have any friends because you haven't lived long enough to make a friend. It takes a little heap of living to make a friend. Because it takes a little time to see your relationship tested and tried. And you see the unhesitating way that friend stays with you, right or wrong. You say, oh, we should approve our friends when they're wrong. Yes, if you can do that. Well, I thought we should, if we were friends, we should judge them and condemn them. If you're God, do that. A friend is someone who says, I don't understand where you are. And if I see correctly, I wouldn't want to be there. And I don't think you should be there. But that isn't my business to decide why you are where you are. My business is to love you and be your friend, win, lose, or draw. How many friends do you have that you could call friends? He asked me, he said, do you have any friends? I said, yes, I do. He said, I suppose you would tell me you have hundreds of friends. I said, no. I doubt seriously if I need all the fingers on both my hands to count them. I'm beginning to experience that. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I have some. And they're like money in the bank. You don't use it. You don't draw on it. You don't lean on it. It's just there, and you know you have it if you have to have it. You know? You don't use your friends. You don't lean on them. You don't draw from them. You just know they're there if you have to have them. Count on them. And my friend Beretta says, you can take that to the bank. <laughs> Jesus is my friend. John said in describing friendship, he said, John the Baptist, he said he was a friend of the bridegroom. Remember him saying that? And then he said, so he must increase and I must decrease. And that was his definition of what his friendship for Jesus meant. I'm Jesus' friend. And out of my heart comes this desire that he increase and I decrease. Now, Jesus has proven to me he's my friend. I watched him decrease when he came to this earth. For 30 years plus, he was a man made of no reputation, decreasing every day of his life, that I might increase to the stature of a son brought to glory. I watched him decrease at the cross of Calvary until he plunged into hell for me that I might be increased into the glory of his Father's presence. Is he my friend? Oh, yes. And having already proved his friendship, he often asks me if I'm his friend. 
And I have no other way to judge my friendship for him than the way John judged his. And if I know anything about my heart this morning, I can tell you honestly, I am Jesus' friend. I desire more than anything in my heart that he increase and that I increase, decrease in your eyes. That's friendship. He's my friend. And I'm his friend. We have this thing. I like that, don't you? He loves me as my husband. He loves me just as I am. I may have spots and wrinkles and blemishes to your eye. He's not blind to my faults. But he never looks upon them like you look upon them or as I look upon them. He sees them as evidences of beauty. Why? Because they're a part of me. And it's me that he loves, not my spotlessness or my blamelessness nor blemishlessness nor wrinkleness wrinklelessness <laughs> those are hard to say when you make up words that isn't what's beautiful to me I'm beautiful do you see the difference man looks on the outward appearance and he finds beauty where the spots and wrinkles and blemishes aren't God looks on the inner man of the heart he looks right through the spots wrinkles and blemishes they're expressions of me And he loves me. And these things are of no hindrance to him loving me. And if you would ask me what it's like to be married to Jesus, I would tell you this. He's easy to live with. He's easy to live with. Oh, he's, he's beautiful. He just, it just blows my mind every day. I expect him to react in a certain way to me, and he doesn't. I do not expect him to react in a certain way, and he does. He just keeps me totally surprised, delighted, and confounded. The way he does things for me, for instance. I'm not talking about giving me things. No, when he does some little thing for me out of the love of his heart for me. He never does it to provoke some praise from me. See? He doesn't say, now I've done this thing for you. Now praise me and give me glory and give me thanks. That's what I really wanted. So really I've done it for myself. And I used you. Now, he won't do that. He will do things for me out of love and never mention them to me. And I find them out later all by myself. And then I fall at his feet and say, Lord, you did this thing for me. Thank you. He says, okay. I wasn't going to say anything about it, but since you discovered it, I did it for you because I love you. You find it to be true? Yeah. yeah. And whenever he does anything for me, he never expects me to pay him back. Nor does he do it out in public in the presence of others so that he can use me to get praise and glory from them. You know, a lot of people are good at that. They're so kind and nice to their wives and husbands in public. So others will praise them and say, perfect wife, perfect husband. Notice that. Then they go home and bitch and cry and fight. Huh? Yeah. Jesus never does that. He treats me in public just like he treats me in private. He doesn't know the difference between public and private. He treats me behind locked doors just like he treats me right out here in the union hall on Sunday morning. Just the same. And when he does something for me, he doesn't warn me and tantalize me for days ahead of time, exacting out of me some performance that I wouldn't have given him ordinarily for fear of losing my reward. You know? That's the way we do things. If you're a good boy, I'll take you to town on Saturday. The poor guy has to live in misery all week long. Jesus doesn't say, if you're a good boy this week, I'll do something for you on, on Sunday. He just does something for me on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. And the funny part is that he does it whether I'm good or bad. 
You know why? Because he loves me. He doesn't punish me for being bad and he doesn't hold back any good thing from me for being bad. Nor does he bless me in a special way for being good. Nor does he give me anything for being good. He's good to me all the time. Somebody said to me, Boy, isn't the Lord good to us? And I couldn't help but think what the Holy Spirit was saying to me about this. He's good to us all the time. You're just conscious of it this moment because it turned out the way you thought you wanted it. He's working good all the time. And he showed me about Romans 8.28 recently. We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. And I long believed that that was a true grit verse. That when everything was upside down in my life and everything was the way I didn't want it, I just held on to Romans 8.28 and kept saying out loud, It's working together for my good. But inside there was a voice that said, I can't see any good in this and I don't like it. If this is my God's idea of good, take it away and give me some bad. And I had an awful time getting on with this verse. And then I progressed a little bit in my understanding of it. I escaped that plane and realized that I had to think more about who he is being the God who loves me, and therefore I know that he can't work anything but good for me on the basis of the cross. So that helped me out a little bit. Then I realized there there might be another level of thinking here to Romans 8.28, and I graduated to a much higher spiritual realm, and I got to thinking about Romans 8.28 this way. It doesn't matter what bad comes in my life. It doesn't matter what harm, what hurt, What sorrow, what sadness, what trial, what tribulation. It doesn't matter what comes like that in my life. If God is glorified, that's the object of it all. And that helped me somewhat. But down inside there was a resentment that said, I don't like him using me for a doormat just to glorify himself. You ever feel that way? The rest of you have, but you're too dishonest to admit it. You know, I used to bolster myself up when I was going through some fiery furnace, you know, and I'd say, well, God's probably doing something with my neighbor. Hey, I couldn't care less about my neighbor when I'm in a fiery furnace. I care about me. Right? And somehow I kind of resented it that here was God, supposed to love me, and he'd beat nuts all over me just because some unbeliever sits down the road for me and he wants to impress him. That's the idea that Christianity preaches. And if I were that unsaved neighbor, I would be totally unimpressed by God who beats his wife in the presence of others to show others how strong he is. And I got out of that hang-up by the Lord giving me another thought on Romans 8.28. And I haven't got to the bottom of it yet or the top of it yet. But this is just another progression, and I'm getting happier with it. (laughs) Romans 8.28 goes like this, But we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. Listen. He won't use me just to get glory in the eyes of some unsaved man. He won't wipe his feet on me and beat knots all over me just to impress somebody else with his strength. He is interested, first of all, in being glorified in my eyes, not in the eyes of the world around me. I'm his bride. If you tell me it works any other way, you will tell me that a husband is more interested in what the neighbors think of him than he is his wife. A husband who loves his wife would rather be glorified in the eyes of his wife than any human being on this earth. That's where he finds himself as a man. That's where he sees himself fulfilled and complete, is in her eyes. Right? God is more interested in being glorified in my eyes. He will be glorified in the eyes of the world. My, oh my. God's going to reveal that glory in one shocking moment when he comes on that white horse. Every eye will see him and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him. In the meantime, he's not beating his wife around on earth to make an impression on a God-hating and Christ-rejecting generation. 
He loves you. And I want to tell you, all things work together in your life for one primary reason, and that is your good. God is busy working good for you. That's his most important subject of the day. That's what he delights in doing, is finding a new way to work good for you. And that will work glory for him in your eyes and in your heart, and that will please him. I like that. He assured me this not long ago because I got to feel like a doormat. And he said, uh, I won't ever use you for a doormat. If this chastening, if this child process of learning, if this temporary time of instruction seems to hurt you, it's not because I'm hurting you to impress others and it's not because I'm hurting you just to get glory for myself no matter what it costs you. It means that I love you so much that I won't even hold back the hurt when I know that it's going to work eternal good for you. Trust me, he says. Believe me. I won't work you any harm. I love you. I uh, had an experience, and I have to share this with you, and, uh, and I apologize again for the length of these messages, but... I feel that I have something to say, and I have to say it. This is my only chance. I promised the Lord for the last three or four weeks I'd tell you this. I've tried every way to keep from telling it to you. Because it's too personal, and it's too intimate. And I don't like that vulnerability of opening up the very bottom of my heart and telling you something that's really, really precious to me, because most of the time when I do... There's always someone who wipes their feet on it. It's like casting pearls before swine. And I've tried to keep from doing this. The Lord won't let me hide this because it's something he did for me. Every day for the last three or four weeks, he said, tell the people. So I said, we'll tell you. It's about this same thing we're talking about here. It's hard for me to get used to the kind of love that Jesus has for me. I'm a hard person to love. I don't know why. Depraved, I reckon. <laughs> Corrupt, would you believe? I'm just a hard person to love. It's hard for me to believe in people's love. That makes it hard sometimes for me to believe that Jesus loves me the way he really loves me. I don't have a very good impression of myself to start with, and I get mixed up sometimes in thinking that I'm such an unlovely person, how could he love me? But it's because of who he is that makes him love me, not because of what I am. And so it's hard for me to get used to him loving me, and also I've been brainwashed because I've been taught by example and by word in the religious world for years that God loved me, and he moved heaven and earth to save me. And after I became a saint, he now works everything in my life in a desperate way to destroy me. That's what I got out of the church business. The sinner was always ten times more happier than a saved man. They went around and they could eat uh, ice cream out of a churn, most of them. Face so long. Miserable. Wretched, unhappy, prophets of gloom going around witnessing and spewing their gloom on others. Come on in under the black cloud, it's dark in here. Be saved from the happiness of the world. And come over with us into misery land. And we will all weep and sob our way to the happy hunting grounds. This is the message of the church business. Isn't it ridiculous? So, defining that doctrine, it goes like this. God will move heaven and earth out of love to save the sinner. But when he becomes his son and a saint, and the wife of, and bride of his son of glory, then he begins every day of their life to systematically destroy them. 
First thing he does is wipes out all happiness. Cancels out anything that would give us any pleasure. That's the religious world's interpretation of sin. Anything that would make us happy. That's sin. It makes you happy, it's sin. If it gives you pleasure, it's sin, right? And their definition of spirituality is, if it makes you miserable, it's spiritual. And so they've taught for years, in order to be spiritual, you have to be poor to be spiritual. You have to be miserable. You have to be wretched. And what they're busy teaching and busy perfecting is a whole church full of martyrs for Jesus, bearing his cross. You say, isn't there any suffering in the Christian life? Oh, that's the name of the Christian life. But it isn't that kind of suffering. I'll tell you where the suffering of the Christian life is. It's in the day-by-day conflict of the will of the man versus the inevitable will of his Lord and God before which he knows he must inevitably bow. That's where the struggle is. But hey, what is the will of God in my life? See, we're all messed up up here. I'll tell you what it is. Ask yourself, do you love someone? Second question, what is your will for that person? Well, right off the top of your head, you'd probably say, well, I will for him to be happy. Wouldn't you? What do you think God wills? to be sad no to be happy my son that's in the air force called me a while back wanted me to help him make a decision he said he thought maybe he'd like to get out of the air force said, what do you think about me getting out of the air force what do you think about me coming home do you think I should stay in the Air Force or do you think I should get out? And I said, John, I don't care whether you stay in the Air Force. I don't care whether you get out. And he said, what do you care? I said, I care that you are happy. If you're happy where you are, I want you to stay there. That's my will. If you think you'd be happy if you got out, I want you to get out. That's my will. But you see, my will is not whether you stay in or whether you stay out. My will, my desire, my heart's desire for you is that you'll be happy. Is a true expression of love? I want you to be happy. Hey, I don't want you to be miserable. And if there was some great, eternal, patriotic, national, or international reason for you to stay in the Air Force, I'd tell you. And if there was some patriotic, international, or national, or eternal reason why you should get out, I would tell you that. But I can't think of anything on either side. So I will have to tell you that my heart's desire is that you be happy. Before long, he was to teach me a lesson like that. Because somehow I'm inflicted with this idea that God wants me to be miserable. And that's the only way I can be spiritual. And that's the only way I can be in the will of God is to be wretchedly unhappy. Seven days a week. You don't like this message? Or you do like it? Okay. Good. I'm glad. You'd be an awful mess if you didn't like it. You'd be miserable. I was thinking about taking a trip here, you know. A few weeks ago, you remember when I was going on, going on a trip and I didn't go? I had to confess this because it's too personal and I'm ashamed of how dumb I am. But I, I don't mind being dumb. So I was going to take this trip, and uh, when it came right down to getting everything together and to going, boy, I entered into that arena of conflict that I've been in so many times in my Christian life that my footprints are all over that arena. And the great conflict is, what is the will of God? Does he want me to go, or does he not want me to go? Do you ever have that? If I go and I'm out of the will of God, I will be miserable. If I go and I'm in the will of God, I will have a blessed time. 
confess. Isn't that the way you think about a lot of things in your life? Which is a confession of salvation by works. If I walk the right path, do the right thing, obey the commandments, he will bless me. But boy, if I misinterpret along the way and get out of the will of God, he will curse me. So it depends on me. The decision is mine. And so I followed all the rules I'd ever learned in religion about how to discern the will of God, even according to the ones I wrote in my little booklet. And I said, well, first of all, I'll look into my own heart. And when I did, I said, Lord, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm willing to go or I'm willing to stay. It doesn't matter. I ain't got no big thing about going, Lord, and I ain't got no big thing about staying here. But I do want to do what you want me to do. If you have a reason for me being in Texas or being in Alabama or being in Mississippi where I plan to go or in California, if you have a reason for me to be in those places, I'll be there. I want to be there. If you have a reason for me not being there, I don't want to be there. I only want to be where you want me to be. So I did all that and nothing happened. So then I went through the next little ritual, which is, well, it's a walk of faith. The Lord doesn't give me any reasons not to go, and he doesn't give me any reasons not to stay. So it has to be a walk of faith. He's not going to give me grace for tomorrow, sitting here tonight. So I pick up the telephone and I say, I want a reservation on the airplane. And the lady says, I'm sorry, the planes are all booked up for two days because this is Easter weekend or spring break weekend at the colleges. And I slammed the receiver and I thought, hot dog, you all. Now I know what the Lord wants. He shut the door. He doesn't want me to go. As though, you know, Delta Airlines was the only way on God's earth I could go there. <laughs> so I heard the voice of God in Delta Airlines right there. God saying, don't you go. I've shut the door. And I said, wonderful. Whew, I have peace. And that peace lasted about 30 seconds. Then I sat there and thought, well, I didn't try United. And I didn't try American and National. And, you know, maybe all God is saying is don't go Della. <laughs> so... I don't know how Della would feel about God being against them like that. but So I go back and I reconsider that and I say, okay. So I try another way and that doesn't work out either. And I say, good. That's great. Lord doesn't want me to go. Peace, peace. And I had no peace. So then I said, I left another little fleece out there. You know that the Christian world teaches you to put the fleece out. You know what the fleece is? It is the absolute physical evidence and confession of total unbelief in what God says. God spoke as plain and clear as day to Gideon and told him what he wanted him to do and what he was going to do. And Gideon said, Now God, if you mean what you say, do this to my fleece. Why didn't Gideon say, Lord, you said it and I believe it? And that said it. That would have been faith. So I put this little fleece out and I said, Lord... You know, I haven't got any money. You know, I'm going on the credit card. I had great peace about going on the credit card, you know, Lord, a few days ago because I just thought, sure, I was supposed to go, but I get right down to wire here and I don't have a whole lot of peace about going. I don't have a whole lot of peace about staying. I don't have any peace about the credit card. And so, Lord, if you really want me to go, I think you ought to give me kind of a monetary evidence, you know. <laughs> Something I can hold in my hand when I get down there at the airline office. And lo and behold, I have a clear blue sky. Somebody hand me an envelope from a person that would have been number 10 in a list of 10 that I would have expected to hand me a gift. It says, for your trip. I thought, that does it. <laughs> you know, Texas, here I come, whether I want to go or not. There was the monetary evidence. Well, Lord, still don't have any reservation. 
So I get up the next morning, I called, and the man says, yes, we have a reservation. Leave today or leave in the morning. I said, what's going on? Now the door's open. The light went red, and then it went green. Then it went red, and then it went green. In the meantime, some of the people called that I hoped to see on my trip, and they said, Brother, we just have an assurance on our heart the Lord wants you here. We believe the Lord's going to send you. And boy, the heat really got generated then. My golly, Lord, you've even told these people down there I'm coming. And here I sit, and I can't move, and I don't want to go, and I do, and I don't, and what's going on? I had my suitcase packed for one week. Never unpacked it. It sat right by my bed every night. And I said every night when I went to bed, Lord, if you want me to go in the morning, you've got to motivate me. You've got to say, go and make it the thing that I have to do today. And until you do, I ain't going no place. So finally, it just kept getting later and later, and the days went by. And one day, I just paced the floor and, and uh, worried and sweat and prayed. I hate to confess these things. I tried the last standby. I went in and picked up the Bible, and I said, Lord, if you give me a word right out of this book. You know, I was expecting to have a verse in there that says, Thou, verily, thou shalt go to Texas. <laughs> and so I picked up the Bible, and I opened the Bible, and it said, and Jeremiah said, you know, the Amalekites are going to do this, and there wasn't nobody in Texas by the name of Amalekites. And you know, I'm reading along about the judgment of Judah and the Syrians, and I thought, I shut the boy, what's that got to do with me? And then my little religious mind said, well, what would you expect to hear from the Lord and Jeremiah? <laughs> Go over in the New Testament and kind of get, at least get in the ballpark where he can maneuver you around a little bit. I mean, you ain't even giving him a chance. I mean, not even God himself could draw something out of the ninth chapter of Jeremiah about taking a trip. Get over there in the book of Romans or over there in the book of Acts, and he'll just steer you right into something. So I go over and I try Acts and I try Romans and I nibble a little bit around Ephesians and I chew a little bit on Philippians and nothing happens. And I just shut the book and say, hey, God, if you can't talk to me straight and relieve me of this misery, let's forget the whole thing. And I went and laid down on the bed and I started to cry. And the cry was a frustration, you know. I wanted so desperately to do what Jesus wanted me to do and I couldn't find out. And that's frustrating. I lay there and I just cried. And I said, Lord, I'm frustrated. I'll go or I'll stay. But like Thomas, I don't want no second-hand experience. i got to have some reality. Now, you talk to me. And you know what he said? I asked him a question. I said, Lord, the reason I'm frustrated is when I look at the door to go, it's open. I can't think of a material, a physical, or a spiritual reason why I shouldn't go. When I look at the door to stay, it's open. I can't think of a material, physical, or a spiritual reason why I should go. He says, then why are you going? Are you going because you have to? Going because others say you should? Going because you want to? Going because I want you to? If I had wanted you to, I would have told you. What do you want to do? And I said, that's the last thing I'd consider, what I want to do. And I said, Lord... I don't want to go. He said, good. It's settled then. I mean, this is what he told me. It was so precious. I made the way open to go. And I made the way open to stay. Because what I really wanted is for you to do what you want to do. If you wanted to go, I made it as easy as I could for you. And if you want to stay, I've made it as easy as I can for you. 
the bottom line is not whether I have some vast eternal reason for you being someplace else or for not being someplace else. The bottom line is I love you and I want you to be happy and I don't really care whether you go or you stay. If you go, I won't punish you for going. And if you stay, I won't punish you for staying. If you go, neither will I bless you for going, nor will I bless you for staying. I'll bless you wherever you are, why ever you're there, because I love you. Do you believe that? That's precious. That's worth a hundred thousand dollars. And you know, he reminded me, he said, you know, you learned that in some of the simpler things in your life years ago. I remember years ago, pardon me for rambling, when it got to be a big spiritual thing that you prayed for weeks before you bought another car for fear you get the wrong car and a transmission fall out of it. And, and when you prayed and prayed and prayed and you finally went out the car lot and closed your eyes and walked around and your hands fell on one, you said, this is it, Lord. This is the car you provided for me. And then it went out and the transmission fell out of it. Then you come back and blame the Lord for allowing the devil to deceive you. It's a terrible kind of religion, isn't it? And he said, you remember I taught you that about the car. You used to go through the same agony about buying cars. And you just pace the floor and you'd weep and you'd cry and you'd look for verses in the Bible, thou shalt buy a Chevrolet. Blessed is the man who driveth a four. But there weren't any verses like that. And you just scratch and scrape and beg and plead and say, Lord, show me what car you want me to drive. Show me I don't want to drive this car if it's not to your glory. I don't want to own this car if it's not in your will. And one day I told you something. I don't care what kind of a car you drive. I care about you. If you like the car you're driving, I like it too. If you like to ride in it, I like to ride in it too. If you can ride in it with peace, you're riding in it with me. I don't really care. I care about you. That's my message to you is he cares about you. Lord bless you.